Hello everyone, and welcome back to War Thunder. In today's episode, I'm going to be showing you some very, very good content from the top pilots of War Thunder versing each other. And of course, I'm going to be taking them on as well. What am I getting myself into? No, but really, as I'm sure you guys are aware, during the Christmas period, there's been a lot of specials that have been going on. I'm sure the ones that you guys are most interested in are the ones like discounts and also those tasks that you can do in order to earn the unique vehicles, the M8A1 and I-301. Now, there's also been another event or task, I guess you could say, that has gone under the radar that I'm sure a lot of you aren't really aware of, and I know that for a fact because the number of people that I've actually seen on the leaderboard is like 10,000 or something, so I know there's a lot more people in the game than 10,000. But it is the 2x2 two two event. 2x2 two two event crabs, what the hell is that? Well, if you go on the War Thunder website, you can read all about it. Otherwise, if you go into the in-game menu, click the events tab and go to 2x2 two two for any of the game modes, which is simulator, realistic, or arcade battles, you'll notice that, yes, you can do a 2x2 two two event battle. Now, I'm going to tell you guys briefly about it, like explain the rules, also showing you guys some games, and yada yada yada, but I'm also going to tell you the prizes. So what can you earn from doing this? Well, the top 1000 can earn a unique title, and by the way, this is for every game mode, so if you're top 1000 in Simulator or Realistic or Arcade, you earn the same thing, don't worry about that. Top 1000, unique title. Top 100, 500 Golden Eagles and unique title. Top 10, you get the 5000 Golden Eagles, I-301, MAA1, and also unique title. So... Rather than me just going in because I wanted to get Golden Eagles and those unique vehicles, I actually undertook it because of a challenge. I wanted to challenge myself, and I'm sure some of you guys are like that. I'm sure a lot of you guys are like that. You like to challenge yourselves just to see how well you could actually do. Even if you don't place in top 10 or top 100 and you only get that unique title, or even if you don't even get top 1000, it's just nice to know how high you could get by trying your best. Now I'm going to spoil it for you guys. I participated in the arcade events one, no surprise there because that's where I'm most confident in. And as of making this video, actually just prior to it, I was in top 10, actually position number 7. Now whether I'm still there or not, I don't know. I have a feeling I've probably dropped if anything, I need to check up on that. And that the reason why is because top 10 is ridiculously competitive. Positions 3 to 10 have such small point differentiations between them that it's really easy to be knocked out of top 10. Somebody else gets in there and other people just move on down. And I have a feeling that if anything, if I'm at position number 7, that means I've probably dropped out of it by now. And I'm gonna have to play more games to get back in there. Not only play more games, but win more games. That's the most important thing. It goes by an ELO system, so you really have to make sure you win. And it can't be like 50-50. You win one, you lose one. No, no, no. It has to be at least you win three, you lose one. At the very least. If you want to keep on progressing upwards, otherwise, you're probably gonna be working your way down. So... In this event, what you have is a 2x2 two two on a modified clift coast, you spawn at different locations, not the usual ones, and for the first 40 seconds, there is a weapon lock. Nobody can fire their guns, and that allows strategies to unfold, and that's what I found so exhilarating and just really, really cool about this experience of doing this event, because it kind of gave a new wind to airplane battles for myself because as you can imagine after playing 3000 or so arcade battles with planes as I have then it kind of gets a little bit stale it's like I love planes but just doing the same old thing over and over it can be obviously as you can imagine a bit stale uh, and this event has actually kind of rejuvenated just my interest in airplane battles because being able to play against not only the top pilots, but just other pilots in a competitive scene and seeing what they do and what strategies they come out with, whether that's with different planes or even the same plane coming out with different strategies, it's just been really, really fun. And sometimes it's been a learning process as well, losing against one particular strategy, because sometimes you'll come against the same opponents game after game after game, and they use the same strategy, you'll lose against it like five times, but then you counter it. You figure out what is the counter to that strategy, and then you win five times against them. And that is just such an amazing process, and I love it. So the only thing is, is that when you start out with this, chances are you might not have a partner, unless you 
have a squad mate. But if you go into this by yourself, you're going to be matched up with random people. And the thing is, you can take on random people or you can take on people who are squatted up as well. Now, if you're partnered with somebody random and you're up against a squad, then you're kind of at a disadvantage. So you have to make sure if you fly out with somebody random and they're good, you need to invite them into a squad straight away and then partner up with them for the rest of your career in this tournament until they come to a limit and you need to join up with somebody else. It happened with me. I teamed up with people. Some of them were good at one stage and then they obviously had a limit so I had to move on to somebody else. Then that person had a limit, moved on to somebody else. It's just the way of things. And actually, oddly enough, the position I'm at now is thanks to partnering up with one of my subscribers, which is absolutely awesome. He loves my videos. He was partaking in the event. He didn't think I would actually come into top 10 because of all the Russians, apparently. But we, we tried it. We teamed up. And lo and behold, we're in top 10. We did it. Now, what you'll notice in a majority of these games is that everybody is using pretty much the same planes, the Spitfire Mark IIb or the A6M2. You're limited mostly to using tier 2 planes in this event, and hence why a lot of people love to use the Spitfire Mark IIb and the A6M2, because they're very good planes. They have cannons, and also their turn time is really good. Obviously, the Spitfire is not as good as the A6M2, but then it performs in other areas such as speed, which can be quite important. Now, that's what most people are using, but it's not like that in every game. I've seen other games where people use energy fighters, and then they have a completely different strategy. It's because most people just rely on turn fighting, and that's where I excel at as well, turn fighting, and hence why I'm using these planes. But I have seen some really weird strategies, and what I'm going to try to do in the, this video, and also the upcoming one, is to give you guys a definition of the kind of strategies, the annoying ones that we had to take on where we lost multiple times and then I'm also going to show you how we eventually countered it so that we won against them. But that'll be a bit later on. These ones are more of the newbie sided games. I mean, not necessarily newbie sided, I think this one's actually in the top 1000 by now. Now the nice thing about the combination of planes that I have is th with the Spitfire and the A6M2, it's a very very powerful one. Because I have the speed, the A6M2 has a turn time. Now, what makes it really, really kind of awkward for the enemy is what plane should I go attack? Should they go attack me, the player in the Spitfire, and also the one with a pretty damn good player card? That means I'm a better player. Or should they go for the A6M2, which is, in a turn fight, a better plane than mine? And it's a really difficult choice to go for. Do you want to go for the player that's obviously more higher skilled, or do you want to go for the plane that's better? And I have a feeling a lot of people had a hard choice actually doing this, because one of the things that you have to do at the very beginning of each match is you have to check the player cards of your opponents, just to get a feeling of how good they actually are. Now, what happens when you come across an A6M2 dual combination? Well, it's pretty damn difficult, I'll be honest. It's, it's panic mode, if anything. Especially for myself. For my teammate, okay, fair enough, because he can take on A6M2s just fine, he's an A6M2. Mind you, he's a Mod 11, which actually isn't as good as the normal A6M2. But, I don't know how I did it. I still managed to kill two A6M2s, one after the other. I guess everything just aligned perfectly. The next match actually made me realize that not all of my games were going to be wins, and especially when we got into higher tiers. This is probably when PPP Perfect was in rank maybe 20, 30, and we were at rank 40. It made me realize that there was really good players. I mean, for him to be turning around that fast and get behind me and instantly kill me, I mean, I just passed him and then he just turned around and then killed me. It made me realize that getting into top 10 was going to be no easy cakewalk. And in order to get into top 10, I would need a very good squad mate and we would have to work together very well. And so that brings us on to the major opponent of this video. The energy fighters or the boom and zoomers. How did we lose against it and how did we take it on? Well, as you might notice, they're using BF109s and LA5s, which up until this point, all the clips I've shown you, is completely different from the A6M2s or the Spitfires that we are used to. This is a strategy that they must have used right up from the beginning in order to get into this high position in this tournament. This must have been around the 40-30 mark 
of the leaderboard. So I'm going to explain the rationing behind their strategy, which at the time of this clip, we had no idea what it was, what they were trying to do, what they were trying to execute, how they were doing it, because this is one of the first games that we had against them. Now, as you might have noticed, the LA5 was the first one to go in, whilst the BF109 was behind him and also at a higher elevation. This is an awkward situation for us because obviously we want to kill at least one of them as soon as possible because having just one other opponent on the battlefield is a lot easier to take on at that stage when it's two versus one. But the LA5's whole mission, his whole point, is that he acts as bait. So he goes in, his life does not matter. Whether he dies is regardless. If he can take out one of us or damage us, that's all the better, that's the ideal thing. If he can take out both of us, well, obviously they win. But even if he just damages us or takes out one of us, that's fair enough. Because what happens is that the BF-109, who's actually been climbing at the back, has altitude advantage because we have dived down to take out that LA-5. Now, it's quite awkward because we need to kill that LA-5. Having the 2 vs 1 is very, very nice to have, so both of us can focus on the LA-5, or one of us can focus on the LA-5 and the other can go for the BF-109, but then we're not guaranteed to take out the LA-5. So, the thing that we came to do was we have to kill that bait. We have to kill that LA-5, and then we will respond with the BF-109. If there is going to be a 2 vs 2, it's not nearly going to be as easy as a 2 vs 1, even if that BF-109 has an altitude advantage over us. Now the thing is, the BF-109 is a fast plane, it's an energy fighter. It is faster than both myself and the A6M2 in a straight, and also at climbing. The only way that you can kill it is to get in either a turn fight, or to have a speed advantage on him, and that's where I'll explain that briefly, but this is actually going to be where we lose. So the LA-5, as you might have noticed, when I was diving down on him, I should have had a speed advantage, but the thing is, he actually pulled up briefly as if he was going to come on for a head-on with me. Now, being not like a crazy mofo like some other players in this tournament, I tried to make sure that I stayed alive, so I broke off from that head-on, and as a result, that actually bled a lot of speed, so much that I dropped from about 500 to like 350. And at 350, that's just not enough speed. And even look at this, at 500, it's still not enough speed. That LA-5 is so damn fast that even at a straight, even though he has not dived down or been an altitude advantage and dived down for quite a while, he can still maintain that speed so freaking good that we can't catch up to him, and the BF-109 can now just dive down on us, go for the pickings, and now the LA-5 has so much distance, he can turn around, and he's gonna be a crazy mofo. He's gonna go for a head-on. I'm trying to avoid it because I don't want to die, but again, that's very, very awkward because these guys, they are so committed to a head-on. They want to win so badly that they're not gonna break off, and so if you break off, that gives them time to shoot at you, damage you, potentially even kill you, whilst you can't deal damage back to them. So almost, if anything, you're forced into actually going in that head-on. In this next game, we're up against the same opponents, but it shows exactly why the strategy is so frustrating to take on. When you're playing in the higher tiers, you're going to be against the same opponents game after game after game because almost everyone squads up with the same person. Now, the difference between the last clip and this one is that you might have noticed that the LA-5 has been replaced with an A6M2. I think that's actually more annoying, if anything, because having an A6M2 means that it kind of negates our turn fighting advantage and we have to get rid of him ASAP most definitely, and that's exactly what we did. Now, his role does not change. As you noticed, he suicided. He went into us straight away. He forced us down to come and kill him, whilst the BF-109 the entire time had the altitude advantage. And so, he had speed on his side. And now he can dive down not only on me, but also my teammate. And now my teammate died, and I'm left in a very awkward position where the BF-109 is alive, and the A6M2 is alive. So I have to go down, and I have to kill that A6M2. I can't afford to have two enemies on the field at the same time because it's going to make it very, very awkward for me down the line. So that's great and all that I just destroyed the A6M2, but now I have a much bigger problem on my hand. 
and that's the BF109 above me and way above me. That altitude advantage converts to huge speed. And so he can not only dive down on me and shoot me as he freely pleases, but he can get away very quickly and then climb just as quick as well and then get that altitude advantage over me yet again. So the only thing I can really do is, well, play defensive. I have to force him down over and over so that he bleeds speed and he wastes his altitude advantage that he has. That's as long as nothing goes wrong. So he manages to climb back up to my level, which I guess is nice, but at the same time, I don't have a lot of speed and he can catch up to me. And this makes it really awkward because I have to dodge him, but with not a lot of speed, that gives him plenty of opportunities to shoot at me. It's just unfortunate for him and lucky for me that his aim isn't great and I can turn it around on him, but he's so damn far and so damn fast, I can't get any reliable shots off on him. With that engagement, I lost altitude and he lost none. He went in a straight line. If anything, he was actually climbing at the same time. Now, I had to push my plane to the absolute limit. I had to WEP the entire time. And as a result, if you look at my oil and water in the top left, I learned something that I never knew could actually happen in arcade. And that's probably because I've never pushed my plane to the limit. Eventually, if you overheat your engine too much, the oil, the water, well, your engine actually takes damage. And so my perfectly healthy engine started to become unhealthy. It became damaged. And so, well, I'm not going to show you the rest of the clip because you can imagine what happens. Slowly but surely, my engine turns from a slight pink all the way to a black. I ended up getting boom and zoomed to death. So this went on for a number of games, and I'm not going to show you every single game that we lost against them, because trust me, it was quite a few, and as a result, we lost quite a bit of rankings. Now, you might be asking, how did we beat them? Well, we did figure out one way, and I'll talk you through it. So they followed their strategy by the book. The LA5 goes in as bait, suicidal, trying to do as much damage as he possibly can. We have to take him out, and so that's exactly what we do. We end up setting him on fire, he's badly damaged, he's gonna go crash into the ground. But now, of course, there's the problem of the BF-109 that's way, way above. So what we ended up doing, I told my teammate, look, you keep him occupied, I am going to climb. The reason why he should keep him occupied is because he's an A6M2. He's a really good turn fighter, and he also doesn't climb as good as I am. So every time the BF-109 dives on him, he should be able to dodge the attacks. Now this plan only works if the A6M2 stays alive, otherwise it's fucked. We, we can't win, because the BF-109 will always have that altitude advantage over me. But as long as he's occupied trying to kill one of us, especially the A6M2, I can go off the map. And as you might notice, if you look in the top right hand corner, it shows the radar. But there's actually a circle that you have to be in, and if you're out with that circle, and as in there's nobody on your team in that circle, then the enemy team starts capping, and they will eventually win. So, whilst the A6M2 is keeping him occupied within the circle, I'm going out with the circle, and climbing. That means that the BF-109 can't come out to chase after me, or else they'll lose because we'll start capping. So that gives me time to actually start climbing, and that puts the BF-109 into a bit of a panic mode, I guess you could say, because the only thing he can do at that stage is kill the A6M2. He has to, and that means he's gonna have to dive. So it's kind of sneaky, but that's the only thing that we could really come up with to counter it. And so, whilst the BF-109 was thinking, oh, what should I do? I keep on climbing and climbing and climbing. And also, that circle extends vertically as well. So eventually, if you get to a high enough altitude, I believe like 6,500 meters, you're out with the cap zone as well. So the BF-109, 100% cannot go higher than that altitude. I will get the altitude advantage. The only chance he has is to dive down on that A6M2. All right, so let me take you to the juicy part. So the BF-109 has dived down to take on the A6M2, and I now have a massive altitude advantage. I'm at about 7,000 meters above the surface, which against the BF-109 is absolutely awesome. That means I'm gonna have huge speed, so much that I can catch up to the BF-109. So here it comes my approach. He is probably in panic mode. He can't turn around because the A6M2 will probably screw him up in a turn fight. I'm coming on down because, well, I'm gonna boom and zoom his ass. Yes, very ironic. The boom and zoomer getting boom and zoomed. So I have huge speed here. 700 
and counting kilometers per hour. He has nothing on this. Although he is a fast plane, he's an entry fighter, I still have massive speed over him. And I can catch up to him. Getting closer and closer with each cannon shot becoming more and more accurate. Landing on him, causing him to smoke and take more and more damage. And I'm really getting close to him now. The thing is, he could keep on going in a straight line. But then I would still be able to shoot at him. Or he could try to turn fight, which is probably the more stupid thing to do, but I think he's really suicidal and desperate at this point. He's trying to take down as many people as he can of him, and so he does take down the A6M2, but we won. And that felt absolutely amazing. To win against this strategy, to have countered it, was just an absolutely amazing thing. And it's not the only strategy that we have had to come up with counters for. There's actually other ones, and I want the other videos that I do on this tournament to feature those strategies as well. To give them each sort of like a theme in that episode. So I hope you guys enjoyed this. It's very, very tense doing this tournament, and I really recommend you guys to try it. Even if you don't get into the top 1000, I think it's a lot of fun and you guys will have a lot of fun with it. But there we go, so I hope you guys can leave a like on this because I've spent a lot of time playing this tournament. I got into top 10 and I think that at least deserves a like. So thank you guys and until the next episode, this is Krebs and I will catch you next time.